People will tell you that HTML is easy, but then they just use divs for everything. Well, HTML is more than just divs. So today I'm gonna to be looking at five elements that you don't see used too often, but that you could definitely be using in a lot of the sites that you're creating today. Hello, my friend and friends. I'm so glad that you've come to join me once again. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin. And here at my channel, I help you make the web and help you make it look good with weekly tips, tricks, and tutorials. And as I said, today, we're going to be looking at a few HTML elements that aren't used as much as they probably should be. So let's jump right into the code. All right, so the first one we're going to be looking at here is the mark element. And there's actually two different use cases where you could use the mark element. First one is within a block quotes or within quotes. And the second one is to highlight text in different ways, but basically it's used to highlight things. And I'm gonna show you the first use case and we'll talk a little bit about the second one. And so let's come here and let's say we wanted to, and this is sort of like the idea of when you read something that says like you can add in, um, you know, it's here's a quote from it and like emphasis is mine. Uh, like the author is trying to show that, you know, they're adding emphasis to something. So they're trying to highlight part of it to say this is, important but it's i'm highlighting this it's not being highlighted this wasn't like the emphasis wasn't put on by the the person who said the quote it's the, this is what i'm highlighting to draw attention to it as the person writing an article and as the person quoting this text and as you can see the default for it is this bright yellow that looks like it's been highlighted and if we come and take a look at the code in here not the code but the default styling you can see the mark element and all it's doing is adding a background color and a color to it so it's very easy to style and to change. So if you wanted to, you could easily uh, just, we could come in and into our own CSS here, we could come and say that the mark has a background and you can make it more of a brand color if you have some brand color going on. So, you know, if say we have a blue four, which is a custom property coming in. So I can change it that way. I could even say that the background is transparent and highlight it in a different way. So we could do a font weight of say 900 on there or whatever we want to make the text bold you can find and actually that's maybe a little too bold but you know the idea is that it comes with default styling but like most things it's easy enough to override and uh, without that you might notice that if you use chrome this actually looks pretty similar to if you do a control f to find something and so let's let's actually look up a different word i'm gonna look up sit and just because the first one gets highlighted in orange but you can see all these sits so when you do a control f uh, it, the browser highlights it by default with the mark. And this is also, Google does this in search results now. Sometimes if you click a result, it brings you to a certain place on the page and it highlighted the text from like the description it was showing you. It's all using the mark to draw attention to something. That's the whole point of the mark element. And while the mark one is maybe a little bit more obscure and something that you won't see all the time, uh, the, the time element is one that I really think is underused and should be used in a lot of places where people don't realize that it could be. Um, you'll also hear this called the date element. So it's the date or the time element because you can do both. Um, and let's say here I wanted to wrap this. So I could say this is the time and then we could close that off right here. Close time. And just doing this, it won't actually add any additional styling to anything, uh, though obviously you could hook in through your CSS to style the time elements if you wanted to. Uh, but what this does is it gives us the ability to actually give more context to the time that is on the page there. So right now we're saying January 4th at 8 p.m. We can have this include even the year or other information. And we can do that by using the date time attribute. And the date time attribute is actually really a handy one to have because let's say you have a published date that an article has been published on. And this is really, it's basically the time date here is to give it a machine readable bit of code. And so it makes it easier for blog posts and so if Google is searching your site and it wants to know when an article was published and it only says, let's just say it was published on January 14th and you don't include the year for some reason, you probably should just for the users of the site. But let's say you could actually include that year within the date time here. Um, for all of these, I am linking to MDM articles that go into more information on all of them because there's lots of valid date time things that you can put in here. Um, so the date is going to be year first, so 2022, then the month, so January would be 01, and then 14. So you could just do a simple date time like that. Uh, you could also include times in it and do a lot more, like I said, and it just gives a little bit more context to what you're putting out there. And as I said, it helps for machines reading your site, which most people uh, are always asking me about SEO and stuff and publish dates and update updated dates on posts are always good things for Google to know because from what I understand, somebody could correct me in the comments below if I'm wrong on this, uh, but from what I understand, especially with blogs and other things, 
Google generally likes more recent things because it knows that generally they're more up to date than something that might be eight years old, right? And, and some people do try to take advantage of that and hack that a little bit, but this is one way that we can give a time for when something is posted. Um, another one is the output element, which I've been asked about a fair deal. And basically it's if you have different inputs, you can have an output there. So here I have two inputs that just take numbers. So if I go here and we give it two different numbers, you can see value one plus value two, and it's giving an output. Now I am using some JavaScript to actually get this to work. Um, so you can always go and check this code pen to get the code for that. Uh, but yeah, we can have output. So you're saying, and you don't have to have only two uh, values. You could have multiple values. It doesn't need to be super simple values like this. You could do a little bit more with it, but it really is when you're taking various inputs and outputting something. So this wouldn't necessarily be like a search form input. And then you're outputting a whole bunch of stuff. From what I understand of the output, you can only put phrasing content. So there's no like block level elements effectively that go in here. You're just putting strings of text. So uh, to take that into account, if you want to see another example, actually, uh, something I built not too long ago for because I'm a home brewer was this force carb calculator where I used it. So you have your pressure, time and temperature. And if you play with that, this is my output that's right there. And we can switch back and forth um, between Fahrenheit and Celsius as well, which can be handy depending on what you want to use. Uh, but yeah, just a, a, a little tool that I put together and where the output seemed like a good choice. And that was actually somebody on Twitch that recommended I use the output on that. So thank you. One of the fun things about streaming is you learn new things. So there's the output. Uh, there is a little bit more that you can do on this. You can actually say four and say what it's doing. So I could put val one space val two because these IDs that are right here. Um, so you're using your val1, val2. So I'm just saying that this output is linked to these two uh, inputs here, and that's where that value is coming from. Um, so yeah, just a little bit extra that you can do on that. You can also have it have a name, and the name can be linked in with the form API, and that can be useful as well to help speed things up uh, when you're trying to do these types of calculations. All right, up next is one that you really don't see used a lot, but I'm sure 100% sure you've seen it before, which is the ABBR or the abbreviation element, which is kind of cool because it is an abbreviation in itself. And so anytime you have an abbreviation, we can use the ABBR element or the abbreviation element. And so let's go and look here and you can see that I am in here. I did put a few abbreviations like ABBR. So that would actually make sense to have that be an ABBR. And let's just move that ABBR into the ABBR. <laughs> and you'll notice when I used Emmet to make that tag, it actually came with the title by default. So let's just go and look and you can see the ABBR now has an, a dotted underline on it. And when you do this, you should give this, so it'd be abbreviation. Um, so abbreviation, ABBR is short for abbreviation. And when you get these little elements, it gives you a little tooltip where if you put your mouse over it, you get the full version of it. So let's just say you had units like this and everybody knows what millimeters are, but you can do the same thing. ABBR title equals millimeters. Did I spell that right? I don't even know. And close uh, ABBR. I hope I spelled that right. <laughs> um, but again, miles per hour, you could do something like that. Or even here we're HTML, so we could do an ABBR title equals hyp hypertext mark markup language and I should have had word wrap on but I don't have it on in code pen uh, close ABBR and there we go now I get my my HTML there and I know it's going off screen for you but I can see the whole thing um, where it says the whole hypertext markup language so let's just change the size of that so you can see the whole thing there we go and so yeah that's how we get these little nice tool tips that come up the tool tips you cannot style as far as I know uh, they're just coming from the system itself but you could always style what this looks like on its own because I won't do it in this example, but always you look in your here, we see the ABBR and right there, text decoration is underlined dotted. So if you want to overwrite that, you can always come in with your own styling on it uh, to let people know that there's a little bit of extra information in there. And another one that's related a little bit to ABBR because they're often used together is the DFN, which needs its own ABBR because the DFN is for definition. And so the DFN element is used to mark a term that is being defined within the current sentence in general. Um, you can also, this is used inside of paragraphs. You can also use it in uh, definition lists as you might be able to guess, um, which maybe is an, another obscure element that not enough people use. Um, but in this case, we could put around this, 
the uh, DFN and close DFN. And this actually comes with a little bit of extra styling, whereas by default, it's making it italic. And that's because we're saying the DFN element is used to mark da 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 da. We're just, so this sentence is defining what is an italic here or what's inside the DFN. And again, you can come in with your own styling of it. And of course, we could combine this with other things as well, um, where I won't come up with a great example, but let's just say you had uh, CSS in here. So um, we could you, you can combine these, as I said before, with the output and the ABBR. So let's do our uh, DFN. And then inside the DFN, we can have an ABBR and we can put in cascading style sheets here. And then this would be my CSS is a language that frustrates, <laughs> that frustrates a lot of people uh, that is used to style the web for a really bad uh, definition right there. But um, there we go. And CSS is the language, and then you can get cascading style sheets. And when there is a title that is nested inside of a DFN, or you can even have a title on the DFN, I believe, um, officially, the title here is what's actually being defined. So we're not defining CSS exactly, we're defining cascading style sheets, the full word. Um, not that it makes a difference in this case or anywhere you'd be using it like that, but just to say um, that it does mean that we're defining this that's right here. Now, one thing that's important is you don't need to redefine it again. So here, if we had the definition, so the define element here, um, I'm using it again over here in my code. So here, the DFN element are, uh, so yeah, I'm talking about it here, but then later on when I use DFN, I don't need to put the definition there again because I'm not defining it anymore. What's really important with this one is the, and it can be a section or a paragraph or the definition list, like I said, um, that where it's used is where you're defining it. You're not sort of talking about it, then defining it later on. It's really important that this DFN is used where you're actually defining that term. And so yeah, these are some of these underused HTML elements, but interestingly enough, there's a lot of common ones that are out there that people get wrong. And that's even including things like our heading levels, our H1, H2, H3, and all of that. People don't really understand the implications that those have. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, I have a video right here for your viewing pleasure where I talk just about that. And with that, I want to say a very big thank you to my supporters of Awesome over on Patreon, Jan, Johnny, Stuart, and Tim, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.